rise together in the presence of God as he calls us to worship with these words from Psalm 46. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord be with you. Let us now worship him. vocation. My father, the psalm, Psalm 72, which this hymn was based upon, says that you will deliver the needy who cry out, the afflicted who have no one to help. My father, as we begin this service, we ask that you give us a right view of ourselves, that we in fact are the needy, that we in fact are the ones who have no one to help in terms of answering the greatest questions of life. How could we be made right before a holy God? We pray that you deliver us, that you deliver us from our fear, that you deliver us from our indifference towards you, that you deliver us from our hardness of heart, that you deliver us from the obstacles, the distractions that are so prone to enter our minds now, and you help us to realize that what's at stake is eternity, and that the matters we discuss are spiritual matters of greatest consequences, and of greatest joy in our lives. Holy Spirit, you know the work that needs to be accomplished in this room today. And we ask, whether child or adult, that you accomplish that work, that we might leave here the greater understanding of who Christ is, what he's done on our behalf, and how we can respond to him in a life of joyful obedience. We ask this in the name of Christ and all of God's people said, Amen. Our confession of faith this morning comes from the Heidelberg Catechism. And ask this, what is your only comfort in life and in death? That I am not my own, but belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation. Because I belong to him, Christ, by his Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. Amen. Please be seated and open your Bibles to our New Testament lesson. It's Romans chapter 10. Verses 9 through 15, it can be found on page 1,720 in the Bibles uh, beneath you. Page 1,720, Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 15. The book of Jonah describes the need for 
uh, people to hear the gospel, the need for the gospel to be preached in this world. And today the text from Romans summarizes truth that people are in need of hearing the gospel and how might they in fact hear it. Romans chapter 10 verses 9 through 15 says this, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. As the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who, good, who bring good news. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. As we begin our series in Jonah today from the belly of the fish, Jonah cries out the man's greatest need is that we cling to worthless idols. This morning we have an opportunity to confess our sins, to, con to confess of the worthless idols that we cling to and to turn from them and to turn to the Lord and to hear of his assurance of his pardoning grace. With this in mind, please take a moment for your own personal confession of sin and then we'll begin our corporate confession of sin. And now a corporate confession of sin. Almighty God, we ask you for grace to recall our needs, to know your will, to care for others, to repent daily, to pray consistently, to be zealous for your glory, and to find our deepest joy in you and in your holy will. We confess that we have failed to seek out your will in the scriptures that we have kept you at bay while enjoying our sins, and that we have sought our own ends and lived for our own glory. Have mercy on us and forgive us. Work in us a profound and continuing repentance, a grief for sins that trembles and fears, yet ever trusts and seeks clearly the brightness and glories of the saving cross, for the sake of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Our assurance of parting grace, it too comes from the Heidelberg Catechism and asks this, how are you righteous before God? Only by a true faith in Jesus Christ. That is, though my conscience accuses me that I have grievously sinned against all the commandments of God and kept none of them, and am still inclined to all evil, yet God, without many merit of mine, of mere grace, grants and imputes to me the perfect satisfaction, righteousness, and holiness of Christ, as if I had never had it, nor committed any sin, and myself had accomplished all the obedience which Christ had rendered for me if only I accept such benefit with a believing heart. Please stand in this assurance.
Our Heavenly Father, we come gladly and with great relief into your presence, knowing that you accept us, not according to who we are in ourselves, but according to the righteousness of Christ. The righteousness of Christ earned for us by His life, and He has imputed His obedience to us such that when you look at our record, you see His obedience and not our disobedience. The righteousness accomplished by Him passively on the cross so that when you look on our otherwise deserving damnation, you see His beauty and His splendor and His righteousness and complete submission to You. And You welcome us as Your beloved sons and daughters. And You say to us as You would to Him, ask what You would of me. You are my beloved. It is my delight to give it to You. We pray, O Lord, that every person gathered here and within the sound of this prayer would come to you for that righteousness and know you this day as their Abba, Father, the Spirit bearing witness with their spirit that they are children of God. We come to you with the deep longings of our hearts, the deep needs of our hearts, the, the full understanding that we are still hypocrites and sinners and still need the application of your gospel to us daily. But we come knowing, too, that you as a father say to us, cast on me your anxiety. It is my delight to carry your burden. We pray not just for ourselves, but for other members of our covenant family and ask that you would help these, some of whom are very burdened. We pray for Kate Ryan tending to her terminally ill mother this weekend, for Joan Vesey and Joel Reese recovering from a major surgery this week. We pray for Hallie Mary as she uh, grieves for her brother Ray Lilly, who's undergoing cancer treatment or brain cancer treatment, and, and this week has sustained very serious burns at the same time. And then Hallie's mother as well, uh, undergoing cancer treatments. We, we ask, O oh Lord, would you please bear up the Mary family and their burdens? And we pray for Rita and Roger Holland. We thank you for bringing Roger back here safely from Zambia and ask that uh, the dialysis would have its, its uh, intended result, that you would grant healing to him. We thank you for the blessing of their presence with us even this morning. We pray for Nicole and Jason Medlin as they leave for South Africa on Wednesday to pick up little Xavier. And we ask that you would bring them back uh, without complication, without event, that we might welcome the newest member of our covenant family. For Jason Lutz, as he uh, battles cancer, please give him endurance and uh, please take care of the baby that they are expecting as well. We pray for the National Parish. Thank you for their generosity in, in, uh, in attending worship in the youth ministry building today to make more room here and ask that you would draw them ever closer together as a community too. Thank you for the privilege of participating in the expansion of the kingdom of God by, by giving and by, by praying for the work of Christ to continue. We pray today in particular for Nathan and Audrey Wilson, along with their children, Jacob, Joshua, Peter, Lydia, Jane, and John. And thank you for this group of 10 who have transplanted to Cusco, Peru, and uh, have taken faculty positions there in the, in the medical uh, school, and who are giving their lives to the students and to patients and using their skills to heal bodies as well as to introduce them to the Savior who heals them both body and soul. We thank you, Lord, for this generous people, these who have given even ahead of schedule for the building program, and thank you for the progress made in the sanctuary and the other uh, projects that are undergoing, and we look forward to worshiping together in that sanctuary in June the 2nd. And in the meantime, I praise you, Father, for the patience of these people and for what you've done in us and how many you have uh, added to our number who have never even been in the sanctuary. We thank you for your goodness and ask that you would continue to provide for our needs and help us even now with the overflowing space, overflowing uh, Sunday schools and children's ministry 
uh, areas, would you provide for those needs as well? But most importantly, we ask that you would multiply our gifts, that the good news of Jesus Christ would be preached and, and shared and exemplified here in our city and around the world. We pray it in the strong name of Christ. You taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please be seated. Please pass the fellowship path. satisfies your every need, offers you peace with your heavenly Father, and to remind you of this, that the peace of the Lord be with you always, and also with you. Please stand out and pass that peace one to another.
seated. And turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Jonah, our third book in our series on the minor prophets. So far we've studied Obadiah and Joel, and now Jonah. You can find it on page 1436 in the Bibles provided for you, 1436. And uh, over the course of our study, I'll share with you how the Lord used the book of Jonah in my life, especially in college, to introduce me to a God I didn't know existed, a God who is as gracious in the Old Testament as He is in the New Testament. In fact, I didn't realize that He was as gracious in the New Testament as He is in the Old Testament, that God turned my mind and heart around with this compact Old Testament book presenting so powerfully, yes, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ even eight centuries before he was born. Our best estimate is that it was written sometime in the middle of the eighth century BC because he identifies himself at the beginning here as Jonah, son of Amittai. There's another Jonah, son of Amittai, 2 Kings chapter 14, who, ran, who uh, pastored and prophesied uh, in the reign of Jeroboam II. And uh, that Jonah is the one, presumably, who is preaching to us here and preaching to us through the hypocrisy of his own life. He is not only confessing to us his sin, but he is bragging on the sovereign grace of God that captured and conquered his heart and turned him into a true follower of the true God of grace. I want you to be prepared to meet one who by numerous miracles demonstrates that His grace is sovereign and persevering and conquers in our stubborn wills. We begin reading in verse 1 of Jonah chapter 1. Jonah says this, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. And the Lord sent a great wind on the sea. Such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid. Each cried out to his own God, and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck, where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, How can you sleep? Get up and call on your own God. Maybe he'll take notice of us and will not perish. The sailors said to each other, come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. They cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. They asked him, tell us, who is responsible for making all this trouble for us? What do you do? Where did you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? He answered, I am a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the land. Well, this terrified them, and they asked, what have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord because he had already told them so. The sea was getting rougher and rougher, so they asked him, what should we do to you to make the sea calm for us? Well, pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it'll become calm. I know that's my fault. This great storm has come upon you. But instead, the men did their best to row back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. So they cried to the Lord. O oh Lord, please do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man. For you, O oh Lord, have done as you pleased. They took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. At this the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. But the Lord provided a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was inside the fish three days and three nights. Brothers and sisters, this is the very Word of God. Thanks be to you, O God. Let's pray together. Open our eyes, please, O Lord, to see afresh the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ as He preached it long before His birth through the prophet Jonah. And would you conquer us with it 
either for the first time or for the thousandth time. We pray it in Jesus' name. God's people said together, amen. You probably don't know her name, but you recognize or would recognize her face. Her name is Fon Kim Phuc. Fon Kim Phuc. She lived in Vietnam. Her face is one that you probably have seen on the cover of Life magazine. It was there in 1972. A man named Nick Utt took her picture as she ran from a family uh, temple thinking that she was hiding in safety there. She was running with the skin literally burning off of her body as she did. She was yelling, Nong Kwa, Nong Kwa, too hot, too hot, pleading for someone to help her. The American forces had dropped napalm on her village, not realizing that there were civilians there. And she, at 14 years of age, was being burned alive. No one expected her to live, but she went to the hospital, stayed there 14 months. She endured 17 surgeries, and the doctors saved her life. But this is what she said. The anger inside me was like a hatred as high as a mountain, and my bitterness was black as old coffee. I hated my life. I hated all people. I hated all people who were normal because I was not normal. I wanted to die many times, but the doctors saved my life. They helped heal my wounds, but they couldn't heal my heart. Somehow she spent time in the library after she got out of the hospital. She was reading. Somehow she found a New Testament and started reading the Bible, and she couldn't believe what she was reading. She was confused by it. Here was a God who on the one hand was all-powerful, the Bible said, and on the other hand said He was all-loving, He was all-gracious. How could these two things fit together? She went to her brother-in-law who didn't know the answer, but she said, he said, I have a friend who's a Christian. Maybe he knows. She went to church with him, and she said by the end of the service, she could not wait to trust the Lord. Jesus helped me learn to forgive my enemies. I finally had some peace in my heart. Now when I look on my scars or suffer pain, I'm thankful the Lord put His mark on my body to remind me that He is with me all the time. What kind of God pursues someone with such deep hatred and anger and suffering what kind of God pursues such a person and draws that person to himself such that he could heal by his common grace, not only her physical wounds, but the deep, seemingly incurable wounds of her heart? It is the God of persevering grace that we find in this book of Jonah. It is the God whose grace is sovereign. It is the God whose grace cannot be interrupted and cannot be stopped even by our own wills. And you must believe it. You must believe by looking at Jonah that this is the God whose grace cannot be stopped. And when you understand it, it'll convince you that you are loved as much as you can ever be loved in Jesus Christ. And you will understand not only His love for you as a sinner, but you'll become an agent of that love to other sinners. Now, how does Jonah make the point? He makes it very skillfully. He's a skillful author. And he, throughout the, the whole book is full of ironies, apparently apparent things that seem contradictory. One truth that seems to be contradicted by the other. And uh, there are three big ironies that occur in this first chapter. And those three big ironies are pointed to by smaller ones. So here in the first one, we find in verse 3, here is Jonah, a prophet of God who says he tried to run away from God. The word came to him, Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. I want you to see several things that happened here in this first section that show that, that Jonah bumped into God in every place he was trying to flee. You have to realize that too, some of you who are running away from Him. 
You're trying to run away from him in, a, in another persona, in another, in, a, in another state of mind. You're trying to run away from him by an addiction. You're trying to run away from him by looking for another relationship, another accolade, another achievement. You're trying to run away from him by denying that his grace could apply to somebody that you really don't want it to. And no matter where you go, like Jonah, you're going to find that God is already there. So here's how the drama unfolds. The wickedness, he says, of Nineveh came up to God, but the word of God came down to the Ninevites. The wickedness of Nineveh came up to God, but it came down to the Ninevites. The Assyrians were wicked people. They were the most wicked people on the face of the earth. They even bragged about it in their art forms. They showed that they did the most unspeakable things to their enemies. They, they beheaded them. They dismembered them. They impaled them. They skinned them alive. And they were proud of it. And that wickedness of dehumanization comes up to God. And if it came up to you, what would your tendency be, mine would be, if I were God, I would incinerate them. I would throw judgment down on them. But God does what? He sends down his word. Jonah, it's time for you to go to Nineveh. And you say, no, wait a minute, the message that he's given is go and preach against Nineveh. That's true. But the Bible also teaches that when God sends a threat of judgment, it is always conditioned upon repentance. He says, even if I pronounce judgment, Jeremiah 18, even if I pronounce judgment on a people, if they repent, I will relent of the calamity I have promised on them. So God is sending the good news to them. It's conditioned on repentance. But the wickedness of, God, the, wickedness of the Ninevites come up to God. He sends his word down on them. Now, how does that relate to Jonah trying to flee from God? Because the very word, the same word that is used to describe the wickedness of the Ninevites is the word that Jonah used to describe how he viewed God's mercy to these people. The wickedness of the Ninevites came up to God, and then when God said to Jonah, what do you think about my call? Jonah says, it's a wicked thing. What do you think about my mercy later? It's a wicked thing. Jonah is saying this about himself. The wickedness of the Ninevites, despite what they had done to human beings, the, their wickedness was no worse and really no different from Jonah's indifference, his hatred for this group of people who were unlike him, whom he hated. He did not want them to experience God's mercy, and he was willing to do whatever it took to keep himself from obeying that command. You realize that that person in your life who has done something to you to wound you, and you in your heart of hearts say, I do not want mercy on that person. And if God, if God were in his right mind, he wouldn't show mercy to that person if he would just remember what they did to me. You realize what Jonah is saying about himself? A lack of concern for someone else to experience the mercy that you have received in Jesus Christ is as wicked as dismemberment, impaling, skinning alive. Jonah trying to run from God ran into God's mercy. The second way, the second little irony that occurs in this section is not only the wickedness of, of Nineveh comes up to God and God's word comes down, but now God's word comes down specifically to Jonah and Jonah runs down. God's word comes to Jonah, go and preach against Nineveh, the words that I give you, and Jonah literally comes out of his door in northern Israel, the door of his house, and he looks down the road to the left that it would have led to the east and around the Arabian desert and ultimately up to Nineveh, he looks at that road and he turns his back and he goes the opposite direction. 
And he books a ship to Tarshish, which is on the coast of, was on the coast of Spain. It was the farthest point west that he could imagine. He went to the board, looked at the farthest place that this, that ship was going, and he said, I want to go there because that's as far away from God's word as I can possibly get. Now, how ridiculous is that with a prophet? God, Jonah knew God's word. He knew the Psalms. He would have known Psalm 139. If I rise on the wings of the dawn and make my bed on the farthest coast of the sea, even there, your hand will guide me. Your right hand will uphold me. He knew in his heart of hearts that he could not flee from God. But sin does that to you, doesn't it? It makes you irrational. Not only does it make you a gross hypocrite that you could think it a wicked thing to show mercy to one who is as wicked as you are, but it makes you senseless in thinking that you can run away from an omnipresent God. Third irony is that everybody else on the ship is praying to their particular God. You try yours, I'll try mine. Melkart, Baal, whoever. And Jonah is doing what? He's sleeping. Though in his conscious, conscience he is running from God, in his subconscious he believes, my God's the God of the storm. I don't know what these people are so worried about. God will take care of things. And he lay down and went to sleep. The captain finds him, shakes him from his sleep and tells him to pray. And in the course of doing so, as we'll learn in a moment, God saved the sailors. But God, is, God saves the sailors as he is pursuing his prophet. The prophet who is running as fast and as far away from God as he can runs into God in every place. He runs into him in his implicit faith. He runs into him now as the captain shakes him and says, your God can do something about this. William Cooper, who wrote a number of the hymns that we really love, there's a fountain filled with blood, no for a closer walk with God, and sometimes a light surprises. William Cooper struggled with depression all of his life. He could not believe that God could love him. He thought he was the only elect person that God had changed, had turned his back on. And at one point, even in, the, in his collection of the Oni hymns, the creation of the Oni hymn book, is a famous hymn book, he tried to kill himself. He determined that God didn't want anything to do with him. He turned his back on him, so he may as well kill himself. So he went to the, a bridge over the Ooze River, and he was going to throw himself off. But there were so many people standing on the bridge looking over into the river, he couldn't find a place to jump off the bridge. So he got back in the carriage and he went back home and he decided he was going to fall on his own knife and kill himself. He fell on the knife and the blade broke. And then he hung a rope and he was going to take his life that way and the rope broke. And John Newton, his friend, said, see, God's grace is sovereign. While you're trying to run from him, God is pursuing you. And you and I must realize from Jonah, that God loves your soul more than you do. Some of you are wondering, why in the world, how could God possibly have allowed this physical malady to come into my life, this problem with my health or problem with the health of my loved one or this setback, this financial setback, this career setback? How could God possibly do that? And it's not the case in every situation that God is using those kinds of negative things to pursue you because you're not always rebelling. But if you are rebelling or if you're living indifferently to him, it's not beyond him to do that. If you are living as indifferent to the one true God and the love of the Lord Jesus Christ, your soul is much more precious to God than your body because your body's going to die. Your soul is going to live forever or it's going to die forever. God loves your soul more than you love your soul. And you also have to see in, in Jonah that God, God's agenda for the kingdom of God is more important than your personal agenda. J 
Jonah had a personal agenda, a personal vendetta against the Assyrians. He did not like them. He hated them as a race and as a people. And so he was going to do his best to keep them from experiencing the grace of God. God had a different agenda, not just to save the Ninevites, but to spark a movement of saving Gentiles that would not cease until now. It continues on. You and I are here as heirs of God's salvation plan inaugurated with the Ninevites. God has always had it in his agenda to save those, save representatives from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. And it didn't matter how much Jonah pouted, how much he felt sorry for himself. God's agenda was bigger. It's helpful to realize that, that God's agenda is bigger than your personal one. And when you do, it's liberating. As long as you live in your own little world, you will have a little world that will continue to shrink and continue to swallow you up and make you, from a kingdom perspective, useless. But when you submit to the reality that God has an international and eternal and cosmic agenda, and He has, he is, he has graced you with the dignity of being a part of it, it is liberating. If you belong to Christ, it doesn't matter where you try to run, you will find God. The second big irony in this text is that God evangelizes sinners despite Jonah's life. It's an especially encouraging point to a hypocritical preacher. And it should be an encouraging point to you as a hypocritical Christian. It also must be corrective, a corrective to us. Here, here the, big, the big contrast is between Jonah's absence and God's presence. God while pursuing Jonah. Jonah, for, we don't have it recorded exactly, we just have the allusion to it, but apparently Jonah stepped onto the ship and said, my name is Jonah, I'm fleeing my God. Can I buy a ticket? <laughs> and the sailors remembered that. And when they had trouble, they said, let's find that guy who's fleeing God. Maybe this is his fault. And knowing that still, Finding out from Jonah that he was a prophet, a Hebrew prophet of God, and was fleeing God, he wanted to be thrown overboard. Even after that, these Phoenician sailors humbled themselves and feared Jonah's God and offered sacrifices to him. I remember the other day that Rosemary Garcia, you probably don't, I wouldn't have remembered that name if I hadn't looked it up. But Rosemary Garcia was the second prostitute that Jimmy Swaggart was caught with. Remember Jimmy Swaggart? One of the first in a long line of televangelists who brought shame on the gospel. And Rosemary Garcia came to faith in Christ, she said, as a result of the ordeal. That somehow, in a, somehow she said, God showed up in my life. Only a sovereignly gracious God can save a prostitute visited by a televangelist. And only a sovereignly gracious God can use your and my testimony to lead anybody to Christ. But don't miss the fact that the gospel also had to come to Jonah. It was not just the Phoenician sailors who were saved. It was Jonah who had to be saved. God sent this same good news to him. God showed up in his life. It's communicated by this little word, fear. We studied a lot in Genesis. Fear always refers to God's presence and how people react to God's presence. So this same word can mean, can look like different things in different contexts. So when God showed up in the storm, it looked like being scared with these Phoenician sailors. And then when Jonah says, I am a prophet, a Hebrew prophet who fears the Lord, for him it looked like one who's living in disobedience. And then when these convert, it looks like those who are 
thankful for their life and offer sacrifices of praise to God. Fear refers to God showing up. And when God shows up, he saves. Some of you need to be visited afresh with the gospel. Those of you who are trying to flee from him. 1917, two famous authors were sitting in a bar in Greenwich Village called The Hell Hole. Eugene O'Neill, who was a playwright, and Dorothy Day, who was a left-wing journalist at the time. They were drinking buddies. And somewhere along the line, the booze took over, and uh, the, the uh, guard came off of Eugene O'Neill's lips, and his subconscious began talking. And he started quoting a poem. I fled him down the days and down the nights. I fled him through the arches of the years. I fled him down the Lambertine ways of my mind. And in the mist of tears, I hid from him. It was Francis Thompson's poem, The Hound of Heaven. Francis Thompson is describing his own conversion. And later he says he, he followed, followed, followed after him. You can hear, the, you can hear the, the footsteps of God hot in hot pursuit of Francis Thompson and conquering him. Dorothy Day, it didn't make sense to her at the time. But 10 years later, after she had married twice, after she had conceived twice, after she had aborted twice, and after she had had a child with a woman, a man who was not her husband, she turned in desperation to God and asked Jesus Christ to save her and committed her life to following him the rest of her days. In 1953, she sat at Eugene O'Neill's bedside and she pled with him to put his faith in Christ. She pled with him as Francis Thompson's poem ends, to rise, clasp my hand, and come. The hound of heaven is pursuing you. The hound of heaven is pursuing you if you have never believed in Christ before. The hound of heaven is pursuing you if you belong to him and you are fleeing, trying to flee from him. He will evangelize you. He will bring the gospel to you despite the hypocrisies of your own life or the hypocrisies of those around you. It's the glorious irony of a sovereignly gracious God. And then the final irony is in some ways the funniest of all. It's the great surprise of the whole book that Jonah, by denying the grace of God, confirms it to us more certainly than almost anyone else could. Maybe it spoils the surprise, but I've already spoiled it for you in years past. In chapter 4, verse 2, he gives the real reason for why he was fleeing God. He said, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, Jonah, why are you mad at me? I'll tell you exactly why I'm mad at you, he said, when God had not destroyed the Ninevites. I'll tell you, I knew that you're a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, O oh Lord, take away my life. It would be better, it'd be better for me to die than to have to live in your grace anymore. This is exactly what I knew would happen. I knew because you are gracious in the core of your being and you've always revealed yourself to be that way, I knew that as soon as I set foot in that city, that wicked city, you'd save those people. I had to do something. You realize what strong faith that is? Most of us spend our lives trying to believe that the gospel is really as good as God says it is. Most of us spend our lives trying to be convinced that God loves us, that he really has demonstrated his love in giving his own son to die for us. We believe, most of us, and those who attempt suicide or, or succeed in suicide as Christians usually do so because they believe the gospel is too good to be true. That wasn't Jonah's problem. 
Jonah believed it was too true to be good. It is too true to be good. I've got to save you from your own self, God. I know that your very heartbeat is to have mercy on whom you will have mercy, to keep loving kindness to thousands of generations, to forgive iniquity, transgression, and sin. He tried to commit suicide to stop God from bringing grace to the Ninevites, and even that did not work. It didn't work to prevent the Ninevites from being saved. It did not work in preventing Jonah from discovering afresh the gospel that is almost too good to be true and too true to be good. I have a friend who studied for a graduate degree at Indiana University, and he, he um, was sitting in a class. One of his professors was a former Lutheran pastor and scholar who had apostatized from the faith, and so he spent the rest of his academic career making fun of Christianity, showing how archaic it is and backward and, and out of date and old-fashioned it was. But he was still, he had still been a Lutheran, and he knew that Johann Sebastian Bach was a Lutheran and a thoroughgoing Christian and signed every one of his works, SDG, Soli Deo Gloria. One day, my friend was in class, and this professor was railing against Christianity, and a student from the conservatory found an open piano in the classroom next to his and started practicing, of all things, Bach. And the professor slammed his book shut and said, I can't teach against Bach. Class dismissed. He could not deny what he knew to be true. And his denial confirmed all the more that God is sovereign in his grace and the hound of heaven was still pursuing him in the deep places of his conscience. I said that the story of Kim Fook gets even better. It was announced that she became a Christian in 1982, and it was announced that she was coming to speak at the Vietnam Memorial in D.C. John Plummer had seen that photo on Life magazine. John Plummer was now a, a pastor in Perkinsville, Virginia, pastor of Bethany United Methodist Church. He saw that picture to his horror because he was the helicopter pilot who dropped that napalm. He'd been tormented by it. He had asked his superiors again and again, are there any civilians in Trang Bang where the mission was to be accomplished? There are no civilians there. He had asked them over and over. They confirmed that there were no civilians. He was horrified by that picture. What he had done had resulted in that girl's tragedy. He invited the rest of the flight crew to go with him to the Vietnam Memorial to hear Kim Phuc speak. And she said amazingly in that speech that she had met Christ and he had taught her how to forgive. And that if she could meet that pilot, she would tell him that she had forgiven him long ago. This was in 1996. Plummer sent a note to her asking if he could meet her. And they saw each other. She ran to him. And he wept and cried and pled again and again, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Please forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. And she said, forgive, I forgive, I forgive. Can you believe that story? That story in and of itself is hard enough to believe. Do you really believe that's true? And maybe it's even harder for you to believe that what makes that story possible, what makes it true, is the power of the gospel that has come to you. A power of the gospel that is able to save your sins and even my sins. And it's powerful enough to unleash our hearts and allow us to forgive those who have wounded us, even unspeakably. Salvation, Jonah says, 
from the belly of the fish. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And it belongs to you or can for the asking. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, there are some here who need to ask forgiveness today, need to repent to another whom they have wounded. But it seems impossible because to admit that, well, there would be no end to the grief. But you say that your grace is deeper still. Where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. Set them free today by that repentance. There are others who, who need to tell someone else that forgiveness comes to those who ask for it. There are others who need to believe that it is possible for you to forgive and believe it is possible for you to forgive through them. There are others who have never asked for it or those who have asked for it but have not responded to it with lives of joyful obedience. We all, we all are here in desperate need of the salvation that belongs to the Lord. And would you conquer our unbelief by demonstrating again that your grace is sovereign. Get a name for yourself. In Jesus' name, amen.
stretch forth your hands for his blessing. May you grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and being set free in that amazing and sovereign gospel, bring glory to your God and Father forever and ever. Go in his peace. Amen.